So today I want to talk about the legacy of Howard Schnellenberger. And all that's coming up after the bump. Don't be cornering me. Hold up. Time. You gotta help me with that, that corner sh**. <laughs> What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's always college football related, sports related. We have a good time today. I want to talk about Howard Schnellenberger. He passed away today at 87 and one of the most egregious oversights by the National Football Foundation along with Chuck Ely is that they never put Howard Schnellenberger into the College Football Hall of Fame. Stupid. It's not just what he did at Miami, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. It's also what he was able to do at the University of Kentucky with Bear Bryant. He won the Bear Bryant Lifetime Achievement Award not too long ago. He left Miami to take over franchise in the USFL, which is probably the most pivotal decision that he made as a football coach and changes quite literally the course of college football history. It's also a really sad time at the University of Oklahoma. One year, 1995, did not go well, 5-5-1. Five, five and one. He was accused of being drunk at practices. He ran practices uh, at a way that you just can't anymore, like depriving guys of water. Guys ended up in the hospital. David Board wanted him out, and he was out. But he was able to remake himself and repair his reputation at Florida Atlantic, where they ended up naming the football field after him. And then years later, Lane Kiffin put them on the map with their Conference USA title. And now dudes like Mike Stoops are rehabbing their coaching positions there as well. But the thing I remember most about Howard Schnellenberger is that there is no you without him. The you does not even exist. Football program probably gets scuttled because when he took over that job in Miami, Miami didn't care about football. Miami didn't want to play football. Even as South Florida, in particular Dade County, is one of the richest, if not the richest, high school football talent rich area. Stop saying rich, RJ. Ever. Of all time. Just period. And his idea to rope off what he called the state of Miami, South Florida, revolutionized that program and put him on track to what many people thought was impossible, to win a national championship in the first five years of his being at the University of Miami. And he did a lot of that by convincing guys that would normally leave home to go to places like Ohio State, Michigan, or even Florida State to stay home and to build here, to build at the University of Miami. And he's did it with class, he did it with style, but he started with nothing. And I'm going to reference Bruce Feldman's book here. It's called Kane Mutiny. You should really read it if you haven't. If you're a college football fan, I feel like this is mandatory reading for you. Uh, shout out Bomani Jones at the right time, who's going to do a book club with Feldman and others talking about this book. So if you listen to that podcast, as I do, you're going to have a good time. All right, this is the beginning of chapter two of Bruce Feldman's book. The room was more like a cell than an office. It was eight by eight feet smaller than the bathroom in FSU head coach Bobby Bowden's office. The plaster was peeling off the walls. The windows were propped open as wide as they could stretch. And the palmetto bugs, I think cockroaches on steroids, were scurrying for cover. It was another sticky South Florida morning and the room had no air conditioning. Ten men had piled inside and were seated shoulder to shoulder in front of a burly man with piercing dark eyes, a thick mustache, and a shiny Super Bowl ring. The guy looked like a cross between Colonel Sanders and General Patton. Gentlemen, he growled in a deep voice that sounded like an old chainsaw revving up. I did not come here to waste my time. I could have stayed in the National Football League for years and years. But I came here to win a national title, and I have to do it in five years. Understand? <laughs> this was Howard Schnellenberger. This was how start Howard Schnellenberger started his first staff meeting as the Hurricanes' new head coach. For a program desperate for an identity, it appeared 
that found a man straight out of central casting. Schnellenberger didn't have to travel far to get to UM since he had been working with Miami Dolphins, with the Miami Dolphins, as one of Don Shula's top assistants. But in reality, the guy was light years away from anything the Hurricanes had ever seen before. In 1983, five years into his time at the University of Miami, Howard Schnellenberger led the Miami Hurricanes to an 11-1 season and a national championship. Gave rise to the best football teams that I've ever seen and one of the great just sucks of my life is that I was too young to see that team, to see Jimmy Johnson's teams, and to see teams that Dennis Erickson supposedly coached, but we all know Dennis Erickson didn't run those football teams. <laughs> Matter of fact, while we're here, I got to talk to y'all about the best and most controversial game we never talk about, which is 1990 Cotton Bowl, 91, 90, where Miami plays University of Texas. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, check it, check it, check it, check it, check it. I wrote this down a long time ago. Just thought about it because it's one of my favorite games that I never got to see because I was too young. So this is also uh, a story that you can read about in Feldman's book, Kane Mutiny, okay? So, got to tell y'all a story about quite possibly the best and most controversial game we don't talk about enough. Texas was 10-1, and one, was playing for a national title against Miami, 9-2, and two, in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. Before the game, UT offensive tackle Stan Thomas claimed he was going to take Russell Maryland's Outland Trophy. Thomas also called Miami players typical gangsters. I hope the first play lasts five minutes because I'm going to hit everybody. Robert Bailey and the Hurricanes heard this. Bailey told his teammates he was going to knock out a UT player on the first play of the game. Not only did he knock out UT captain Chris Samuels and hit him so hard that they stopped play for the trainers, he hit the nasty plunge on him. Look that one up on the YouTubes. And take, it to, take a moment, pause the video, go look that up. All right. Now that you are cramped up laughing, as I was too, you should know Miami beat Texas 46-3 in Dallas. The Canes sacked UT quarterback Peter Gardier eight friggin' times. 2019, Oklahoma put UT quarterback Sam Ellinger on his behind nine times, but, you know, that's something else. The Canes picked up 202 yards penalties, including 16 personal fouls for unsportsmanlike conduct. <laughs> Chicago Tribune columnist, Bernie Lincecum wrote about the UT team in that game. He said, or, or excuse me, UM team in that game said, I am not without some gratitude for Miami collecting dangerous young thugs and giving them a place to be angry. Better Coral Gables than on public transportation. Following that season, the NCAA came up with the Miami rule. This is the language of the rule. The use of language, gestures, or acts that provoke ill will or incite spectators or incite an opponent or are demeaning to the game shall be penalized. Now, those Howard Schnellenberger, Jimmy Johnson, Dennis Erickson, Miami teams feel sacred. But as Luther Campbell said, down here in Miami football is a rite of passage. It's even more so like that now because we have a reputation to uphold as the best football players in America. It's mandatory that we hold that down. Also, Mike Francesca was calling the Cotton Bowl. How, how, how come, how come num none of y'all told me that? I had to go look that up myself. I have never wanted to see a college football team more in my life than 1990 Miami, and I hate being this damn young. Deuces.